everybody, it's Victor with Cardiac Wire, and today we're at New York Valves talking to Dr. Hamal Gada from UPMC about some of the work that he's been doing in the Taver space. He's quite the Taver historian, I'm very excited. With that, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, Dr. Gada? I am a Taver historian. So yeah, I'm the medical director of the Structural Heart Program at UPMC in Central PA, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm also the president of the Heart and Vascular Institute. I've been involved in the field of Taver ever since my upbringing into this field of structural heart. So I uh, feel very embedded uh, in the field, I'm passionate about it, very excited about certain developments, and then also try to provide some critical appraisal of data that's been launched uh, over the past few years especially. And with that, um, I know that you were the co-author on a pretty monumental trial with the early TAVR trial. Could you tell us a little bit about kind of the practical applications of that and where we're seeing that go now that we've seen the FDA clear uh, TAVR for asymptomatic AS patients? Yeah. And more specifically for the Edward Sapien TAVR platform for that particular patient population. Look, I mean, I'll be frank, I think that we've gotten out over our skis with regards to the weight of evidence and that's supplying some sort of FDA indication for treatment of this patient population. Early TAVR, to be brief, was a patient population that, yes, was undergoing a trial where they were getting treadmill to confirm the absence of symptoms. 90% of them got a treadmill stress test. I found that to be the best part of early TAVR, is that we were able to pick off some patients who actually had worrisome signs and symptoms on the treadmill and get them the AVR that they deserved and that they needed. But I think that when we studied this asymptomatic population, we had a couple of things pop out that were really challenging to deal with. One of them were patients that randomized to clinical surveillance that then really showed up very quickly with symptoms or the belief of symptoms. Something that we dubbed subtraction anxiety. And so with subtraction anxiety, you basically are taking that control arm and you're not providing them the therapy. And if you're just figuring out symptoms, those patients are much more likely to become symptomatic, especially in the short term. We saw that in Kansas City cardiomyopathy score, uh, questionnaire scores uh, in the trial as well, where people that crossed over and got AVR earlier uh, in the clinical surveillance arm ended up having the worst KCCQ scores pre-procedure. And there's no real reason as to why those KCCQ scores would have differed from any other pre-procedural assessment that was done later on in the study but it turned out the patients who crossed over, or sorry, converted to AVR two years versus converted into AVR like within the first three months, that the way they felt was significantly different and obviously worse in those patients that converted over acutely. So that was one thing that stood out. The other thing that stands out with regards to this study, unfortunately, is just kind of this endpoint that was inserted in where an unplanned hospitalization could have consisted of an aortic valve replacement happening within the first six months after randomization into the clinical surveillance arm. And so that really padded the stats and you get a very significant delta in favor of the early AVR, or early TAVR approach, but then there's a plateau there. Mm -hmm. And so all of the analyses that are being done, I try to kind of pick them apart and you've seen a lot of my posts on LinkedIn doing that and I'll continue to do that in a very substantive, fact-driven way. Um, obviously, I was a co-author. <laughs> I have no problem admitting when data is flawed, though, and I think that we do have some significant flaws in this data set that need to be evaluated, and I think that, again, we've really gotten out over our skis if this is the primary premise that's leading to commercialization uh, of this particular indication. Interesting. So, you know, one thing with early TAVR is obviously because we're moving now to, to apply TAVR to asymptomatic patients, as a clinician, this is kind of outside of the research, what would your cutoff be, right? You have a patient that comes in, maybe they're not eligible for surgery, but they're really, their aortic stenosis isn't there yet. How would you tackle that issue? I think one of the critical things here is like kind of lending more resources into surveilling these people because they will progress over time, okay? And so that's something that I definitely would champion. Um, doing more routine treadmill stress testing with good protocols that actually define symptoms or symptom equivalents, knowing the difference between a modified Bruce stress test versus a modified Naughton protocol, which patient population is best uh, evaluated with either of those. Things like that are kind of in the weeds things that I think we as cardiologists should just get better at. Uh, but I really think it all you know, comes to getting to know our patients, getting to know their symptoms or lack thereof, getting to know what their functional status is, and exploring that in as objective of a way as we can. And I think that that's kind of a critical piece here for cardiology in general. 
Interesting. And so now moving a little bit more to some of your other work, I know that you're very focused on standardization and quality when it comes to TAVA procedures. You know, you're recently involved with the Optimized Pro study. Tell me a little bit about your involvement with that and kind of the overall structure of that study. Yeah, so I was a co-investigator in the original Optimized Pro global cohort, and I would call myself kind of the technical lead. And so the cusp overlap technique that we've come to know underwent several iterations um, to create a more homogeneous, simplified approach, which we originally studied in the Optimized Pro Global cohort. We had 15 steps that we kind of checked off as people were doing their procedures, and we simplified that down to a very simple four-step checklist. The great thing about uh, this iterative development is that it allows people to homogeneously and uh, I would say in a very simplistic way, deploy Evolute, a valve that has had a lot of challenges with deployment technique, implantation technique, and producing those acute clinical outcomes that we need uh, in order to really best serve our patients with that particular prosthesis. And so we were aiming for single digit pacemaker rates and not sacrificing any clinical outcomes whatsoever. And broadly speaking, we did exactly that in the Optimized Pro Global Cohort. We took that a step further. We did a very similar analysis with the Optimized Pro FX Addendum study that I'm presenting here at New York Valves. Uh, really, the whole premise of that study was to make sure that we could really identify a same simplified checklist, if you will, to guide deployment, again, in a homogenous way, with good compliance to that checklist. And then on top of it, do CT scans on all of these people afterwards to really see what we were seeing angiographically, if it correlated to what we were seeing on CT scan with regards to commissural alignment, coronary alignment, and then also whether or not the depth of implantation that we were seeing on angio correlated to what we were seeing on CT. So exciting data, happy to present it here, and it's a simultaneous publication, Jack Intervention, for people that want to see uh, all of what we did in that study. And congratulations on all that hard work. I think one of the best things is when research has a direct clinical application and clinicians can walk away with that and maybe improve their processes. Uh, with that, I wanted to ask you if you have anything for the interventional cardiology community and all the physicians doing TAVR out there, any recommendations, advice, or a message you'd like to get out? Yeah, I think it all comes down to just the best stellar patient care that we can provide, right? Like if our focus is on patients, everyone wins. Industry wins, physicians win, and obviously the patients win. Um, and so really, uh, when we are looking at trial data, we should think about these patients, their lives, and how the implications of this trial that we're studying are going to benefit those lives. And so that means critical scientific appraisal, not being uh, shy or too proud to admit when there are flaws. Um, I think that having that level of humility is just so important in this field. And uh, I, I can say that right now is a really critical time for all cardiologists, with all physicians out there, to really embrace that uh, ethic. Dr. Gata, thank you so much for your time today. I've been Victor, this is Cardiac Wire. See you later.